So uh, here I am at uh, Digital Marketing World Forum with three very, very special guests. Uh, my first guest, we're still looking for them, aren't we still looking for them? Right, yeah. So my first guest um, is from Panasonic, Anand. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, lovely to see you. Uh, my second guest is Lisa from Tribe. Hi, how are you going? Yeah. Good to see you. And my fourth, yes, my third, third guest, I should say, third guest is the wonderful Andy from the Hook Group. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, good. <laughs> right, I really just want to talk very, very briefly about uh, influencer marketing in relation to return on investment. So that's really the purpose of this um, uh, this sort of session, really. What do you think are some of the things that brands ought to be thinking about in terms of getting their ROI? I think the biggest thing that we think about is what is the aim of the campaign. So depending upon that, you set a different ROI. So you can't have a one size fits all. So if it's reach, then that's your ROI. If it's engagement, that's your ROI. And because it's influencer marketing, uh, we strongly believe that advocacy does need to play a part because otherwise you can just do a media campaign. So that would broadly be what we would go for. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it, in influencer marketing is sort of very nascent stage. There's a lot more brands getting on board. They're looking for early conversion-based ROI. Um, so I think we're, we're hearing a lot about conversion, um, but there's a lot of different ways that brands can do that. They can either look at bottom of the funnel tactics with influencers, which might be um, high reach, working with influencers that have the ability to use swipe ups. Um, we'll put links in bios, links in swipes, you know, whatever it might be, affiliate networking. Um, but for us, the, the sort of biggest return or, or the biggest understanding of ROI that we see from brands is when they see it as a multifaceted approach. So yes, you have your campaign by campaign, objectives but you can also look at your influencer activity over time and if you are a brand that has um, no sort of direct digital attribution but you might be a retail brand for example you know what does having an always on presence do for maybe your organic um, search organic um, interactions with your Instagram or your community pages and also what does it do for your product sort of uplift with your retail partners over time um, and then what we're seeing is people using the content that's been generated by influencers in both paid and owned channels and seeing what happens to conversion when you use content that is more relevant that is you know designed and essentially, you know, created by the very people that you're trying to attract, you know, obviously that's going to have a, a great impact on conversion. So, you know, outside of your influencer campaigns, what happens with your Amazon seller page? What happens with your paid activity on Facebook, on stories? Um, and we really think that influencers can provide the sort of volume and variety of content that can drive personalization at scale and can really increase all of those campaign metrics, whether they be sort of top of the funnel or all the way through to conversion, um, depending on wh where your brand's at and what you need to provide at the time. Yeah, I think it, you just got to tie it back to what your your what, what your uh, business uh, business goals are. Um, and uh, I think uh, a uh, longer than a single campaign, you can hit all parts of the, of the funnel, awareness, consideration and, and conversions. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize how powerful uh, the Facebook advertising tool is when combined with um, uh, influencers and other social marketing techniques to actually drive all the way through. So you can build brand advocacy, you can build brand awareness, you can get them to consider a product, you can do different types of content to ta tackle the kind of different pain points, uh, you know, uh, wants, desires of your different customer sets, uh, and then wrap them all down into uh, different conversion funnels so they end up going and buying, whether it's online or uh, in, in store. Um, so uh, f from my point of view, uh, if, it, if you're a new business, it depends where you are as a business life cycle. If you're a startup or a scale up or a direct to consume brand, you're probably going to care more about conversions. If you're a brand like Panasonic, where you're having to compete with some of the big tech giants, then brand advocacy would be, you know, obviously up there. But then I think it's then following all the way through to uh, taking people through the, the purchase funnel. Uh, so I think um, I, I love that 
influence marketing is evolving to the point where people are thinking of it as a full funnel. But I think one of the best things that we can do outside of the metrics we get back in terms of audience and reach and engagement is thinking of the content in isolation in isolation and the, the role that plays in the funnel as well, like what that physical content is representing and indicating in isolation. So one of my favourite examples of organic paid influencer marketing sort of broadly was Logitech and Logitech um, they were monitoring social sentiment from their target audience and they were seeing that more and more of, of that audience was sharing uh, images on Instagram that had a partic particular color variant which was called millennial pink so they decided okay if we take millennial pink and we actually create a speaker for that target audience in that color what would happen to sales and they created it and then they thought okay well how do we enter that conversation in natural way well let's market it back through those customers so they put it out there then they put a brief in, into the tri platform and said okay anyone who's a customer um, of Logitech and who owns this speaker if you'd like to talk about it how would you talk about it and so they, they allow that authenticity to play out obviously they're able to measure conversion off the back of that activity but what they saw immediately on that campaign was their sales went from 80% of their black variant which was their po most popular and it flipped completely to being 80% driven by the pink variant. So they were able to prove that sort of social listening was, was a great factor in determining product development. But they took it another level. They thought, okay, how does this content then work in the paid environment? And to drive that direct click and that direct response, um, you, you lose again the the context of the caption and that influencer and that audience and how they communicate. So all of a sudden the content itself had to do a very different story. How did it show that the speaker was waterproof? How does it show that it had, you know, it was portable, that it had really good battery life? And so we needed content that showed those elements to drive consideration and drive conversion and push people down the funnel. So they, you know, they might not have been the highest, um, engaging photos from the influencer side because that's all about the relationship with that creator and their audience but they were the highest converting images when you um i guess you you ex yeah expanded the audience and expanded um how you market that to the rest of your target audience who don't follow those particular people you think that we working with influencers gives us an opportunity to trial stuff that's brand new and really reach out to stuff well, what about i mean i know we we've seen the fire festival and all the all of the issues and challenges uh, around that but ironically, it was an amazing influencer marketing campaign. We talk about Fire it? Festival a lot in the context of how influencer marketing went wrong. But the reality is the influencer marketing is the only part that went right. <laughs> because they did their job. They did what they were paid to do. Yeah, yeah. And they believed in it just as much as everyone else. And then everybody got fooled. That's a whole different thing. But... Yes, so at the end of the day, it does give you more opportunity to play around. And one of the things that we've done, especially for our cameras, is we've taken people who use our cameras and almost elevated them to become our influencers. So these are people who have been using Lumix cameras, and then you give them the kit or the support in order to go follow their passion or to be more involved in the brand. And as a result, they get more creative with it, and it gives both them and us the opportunity to take a few more calculated risks in terms of how we talk about the brand. That's a really good point. It's almost like trying to elevate it from a, to a camera artiste, isn't it? You know, now we're starting to see people that start with um, uh, uh, endorsing a product and then endorsing a brand and then ultimately becoming the brand. Don't you think that's amazing? How that And that, that just wouldn't happen with traditional forms of media. And this is what we're getting with influencer marketing. We're getting people to be bright. I mean, yes, there are risks because things that are different and new. But actually, what I love is the sort of the... You know, let's do crazy. Let's see what happens. You know, and but but as long as not all brands will will take that risk, but those that do, I think, are going to see really amazing results. But and I when one and when once compa when one brand starts to do it, uh, the others are watching. The competitors are watching very closely. Aren't they? I think the key with all of this is because with influencers, they are people at the end of the day, unlike media that you're buying. So it humanizes the brand as well. Mm, and definitely. part of that is you've talked earlier in the panel about what if something goes wrong and part of being human and identifying with people is that you are fallible things will go wrong how do you then react to it that brings the brand quite ironically actually more closer to your audience as opposed to being this untouchable being that 
you can't identify with. So yeah, it opens a lot of opportunities and depends upon how clever you are in using. I think from my, my point of view, like the, the basic use of, of influencers to kind of advocate a, a, a product and get people bought into it because they're fans of that follow you know, that person hasn't really changed since back you know, Nike that's how Nike grew back in like the forties, uh, fifties or whenever it was that they started. They would start by going and finding athletes that had influence within the running track um, uh, arena and they kind of built from there to then into basketball shoes etc um, the only thing that's changed is now the medium so now you've basically got these people with super followings that are on social media and I think that's where the really exciting bit for me kind of comes in because uh, instead of it just being a kind of one dimensional TV ad that's just talking down um, you've always got the interaction with the users but you've got the real kind of power of of uh, Facebook and Instagram's advertising targeting, um, which, when all wrapped together, has an amazing ability to, you know, build that brand advocacy and drive all the way down, down to sales. One of the points that that you touched on was was integrity, and also, you know, being able to really get an understanding of what your customers want to see as well. You know, we we were marketing one to many, and now brands I don't think can really fathom just the volume and variety of feel feedback they're getting and not a lot of brands are ready to receive that in real time either so one one campaign I remember we worked on was for celebrations so big campaign once a year for Mars obviously Christmas is a massive massive um, opportunity for them and their creative agency had done a lot of research about their target audience and how they wanted to see celebrations communicated and their key insight was that um, on social media people are going to be showing off their tree they're going to be showing off all the different um, types of trees whether it's a cactus or you know a bit of string with some decorations or a big white tree you know whatever it is it was about showing off your tree we put the brief in at the sort of end of November to go live in the first couple weeks of December and Mars got over 600 submissions that didn't show you that people wanted to show off their tree but actually showed that it wasn't Christmas unless you were cracking open a tub of celebrations while you were decorating so actually it was about the the act of decorating with family it was about sharing that and you know how exciting that moment was at the start of december when you got your tree out and you started to do that so for mars that was a that was a real-time focus group um with 600 people in the uk who had gone out and bought a tub of celebrations in that week um and i don't think you can really beat that in terms of getting that sentiment back from your consumers to say you're almost there, but we actually want to talk about the art of decorating, not showing off. It's a slight pivot, but it means that the brand kind of, you know, core communication can really resonate. And I think that that's um, an amazing opportunity for us to get that kind of feedback now at scale. Presumably there are times when you've got planned objectives that you're hoping to achieve, but other things come out of a campaign that you hadn't expected because you're using human uh, influencers that have got a different angle. It's another reason why I often say, yeah, use influencers right early on as part of the, the planning process not as an afterthought right at the end. Do you agree? Um, as a rule, yes. I think you talked, touched upon it in the panel as well. It's part of the bigger marketing that you do. And with campaigns, they tend to be stop and start. But with influencers, it needs to be something that is invariably as ongoing as possible. And it's not something that you work with somebody and then stop and then go find person B and stop and person C and stop. And because you're doing that over a period of time, you keep this almost constant feedback loop going. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're doing it for the same product or the same sort of products, then that adds to the whole um, process of not just delivering a campaign but delivering an authentic experience to the end customer so it's something that is a little unique to influencer marketing i'm sure when you have much bigger budgets you can do it across research as well but it is something that adds more than just a campaign uh, so I want to say a big thank you to my very special guest, Anand from Panasonic, uh, Lisa from Tribe, and Andy from Hook Group. Awesome. Thank you, mate. Wonderful. Thank you.